You're watching Drake Wing Gaming. Enjoy the video. Hey guys and gals, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming. Somebody on Twitter, the Gaming Dragon. Today I'm coming back at you another Let's Play episode of In Case of Emergency. So, y'all, let's go ahead and just jump right back in, shall we? Please sit back and enjoy for the next 18 minutes of entertain you. Let's jump right in. Alarm Chan, you are up. And let's go. Yep, I do believe this is going to be a Luke run. You quickly learn that he's reluctant to talk about himself, and he comes to every conversation armed with an arsenal of clever obfuscations and self-conscious quips. But parts of his life bleed through his hyperbolic anecdotes. I haven't touched a vegetable since I was five. I'm probably allergic by now. Because you eventually discern his parents were too busy trying to secure his affection, acquiescing to nearly every one of his demands. No one hesitated to buy him train sets and video games and doll dress dolls dressed up in lab coats, part of a larger marketing campaign to get younger girls interested in stuff. Now I'm gay and like science. I can't, but I can't dress myself. But and no one made him eat vegetables. <laughs> and his lunch in the dining room is again, is again as though by magic, stocked with steaming loaves of bread and carved meats. And you're a freshman all over again, trying to figure out how not to gorge yourself on the vast variety of food readily available to you all at once. You learn quickly, though, because soon after lunch is Cedric's turn to pull you aside and correct everything you've learned that morning. But Wes said that... And he hasn't had the training I've had. Your training goes relatively smoothly. Oh, that was a weird little thing. Fortunately, you're still new enough to the task that small accomplishments translate to major relative, relative improvements in skill. Being part of a prophecy probably helps, though you're still not exactly sure what's expected of you. Without any formal obligations... It's easy enough to waste your afternoons aimlessly wandering the halls of the castle. It's quieter than you initially realized, but with most of the hustle and bustle confined to areas around the central hall. The farther you get from the castle's heart, the stranger the rooms get. One door leads you to a room of clocks, old dusty grandfather clocks with enormous pendulums, and int intricate wall-mounted ones wrapped in metal vines, and small stout ones meant to be set on a desk, with hands that remind you of a handlebar mustache and seem liable to come to, come to life and break into song. All the clocks are broken, frozen at different points in time. If a broken clock is right twice a day, maybe a whole room of them could be right that could be right that many times more. Another room features bathtubs stacked on top of one another, and yet another, another yet another appears to be an abandoned planetarium. Except instead of planets revolving around a sun, the colorful glass orbs spin around a larger-than-life skeleton curled in the fetal position. And then a long, quiet hallway, and behind a pale green door appears to be a small church. Pews on either side of a moth-eaten carpet that leads to a lonely, dust-covered pulpit. A leather-bound book rests on its surface. Let's get the book. Your hand reaches around the book, a fine layer of dust falling off of it as you disturb it. It leaves behind a clean rectangle of wood in the dust. The words for a funeral liturgy. Remus stands at the door with a placid expression, as though he's commenting on what's for dinner. What? What does it say? It's a prayer for the passage of the dead. We haven't had the cause to use it in a while. You didn't realize there was death in this world, which in retrospect seems foolish. Of course there would be death in every world. It's grim. That's dark. Hopefully we can avoid using it for a bit longer, if we are successful in our quest. Though I suppose it won't matter if we fail. Have you ever lost anyone? The question takes you by surprise. Yes. I lost my dad recently. Remus nods. My parents were led to believe they had lost me early on. The former king and queen? No, actually. They were academics, obsessed with the ancient world. He cocks his head, lost in thought for a moment. Loss is difficult. It changes us, changes the world around us. But no one is ever really gone. When someone leaves this existence, they also leave their absence behind. Like a footprint left in drying cement, or a name carved into a tree. You're not sure your dad left anything of the sort behind, except maybe the weird anxious feeling you get when you try not to think of him. But maybe that's what he's talking about. We tell the world someone was here, though through this violence. To carve something out of this world is just as much to carve meaning into it. What will you leave behind when you are gone? Maybe it's the atmosphere of the abandoned church or the breath or the breathless high you've been riding this entire week. But something about his wisdom rings true. Your persistent anxiety, like a faraway buzzing you've tuned out but never stopped listening to, feels washed away by the promise of by the promise of meaning. Absences or presences. Here's a man with all the answers. I have high hopes for you. Remus smiles as he squeezes your shoulder, the blunt claw of his thumb grazing the fur on your neck and sending a shiver down your spine. Remus leads you out of the room, leaving the book behind in its place, to on, place on the pulpit. Maybe another time. He has other duties to attend to that day, but on others you spot the king in the garden, enjoying a, enjoying a pot of tea into the gazebo. 
When he sees you, he waves you over with a pleasant smile. It becomes part of your routine, your homework and other responsibilities long forgotten amongst the sweet smell of roses. A new path becomes added to your day. The walk through the stones inlaid in the garden dirt, winding through the fragrant thickets of roses, dia dahlias, and lavender, past the vine-covered trellis and into the cool stone halls of the castle. Then it's dinner, more talk about plans, and the climb back home. No nighttime return is as eventful as your first. Being thrown back into your body becomes less shocking and more depressing. You can't help but feel sorry for the person you're leaving behind. He has no idea how great his life actually is. Locked out of real happiness, or is it the reality of his happiness, by pure ignorance? You sleep better than you ever would. You imagine that's your consolation gift to him. A trickle down happiness from the fortunate to the less. A week passes quickly by this way. You wake. Head out the door with a smile on your face. And, with anticipation pounding in your ears... Kieran? Professor Abbott stands in front of his office door, a stack of papers tucked under his arm. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. I'll have your reference letter for your class in today. Oh, right, you'd forgotten about that. You haven't thought about getting a job in a long time, at least a week. Thank you, I appreciate it. You nod and start shuffling away, signaling that you're ready to leave the conversation. You don't have time for this, you're about to embark on a real journey today. Are you trying to leave? You freeze in your tracks. What? No, why would you? He shakes his head and points to the emergency exit before you. That exit is locked. You'll want to leave through the front door. Right, of course. Stay where you are. I just have to stop by the bathroom first. Kieran. This guy will not let you leave the conversation. Be careful. I read in the newspaper that it would be exceptionally hot today. Stay indoors. Right, that won't matter much for you. I will, Professor. Thanks. Your legs are itching to race down the staircase, but if, but you force yourself to wait until you hear the, uh, the sound of Professor Abbott's door clicking shut. <clears throat> Downstairs, the castle is bustling with activity. Staff moving to and fro across the wax floors, balancing various provisions in their arms. You make your way to the dining room, following the smell of freshly baked brioche, when someone pulls you aside and ushers you to one of the castle's many side rooms. A troop of servants are waiting for you, each holding a particular garment that you fitted for over the course of the week. They make stilted bows towards you before asking permission to, to dress you. A week of dealing with straps and buckles has taught you to put aside your pride. Sure, thanks. With your permission, you're descended upon like a swarm upon a carcass. Limbs lifted and stuffed into your leather raiments. Straps tightened and belts cinched. It reminds you of being dressed for kindergarten by your mother. Whatever happened to that sailor outfit? The boots are slid snugly under your, onto your feet. The hardened material soft and supple against your toes. A braided belt is pulled taut around your waist over layers of linen and toughened hide, and there's a leather loop tied to it that you assume your sword, THE sword, fits into. You barely recognize your reflection in the humble mirror leaning against the stone wall. It's both what you expected and nothing at all like it. For one, you don't look like a corny kid in bedsheets with a foam sword. But you also don't look like the grizzled, handsome men on TV, their faces shining with grime, sweat, and blood. So it's, uh, not cool. But it does feel real, which is an unexpected development amidst all this. You're looking at the magic of fairy tales, not flesh to bone, but rags to dresses, mice to coachmen, and frogs to princes. You can't help but check yourself out a little. There's a knock at the door. Oh, nice outfit. Luke peeks his head into the doorframe. Oh yes. I thought you were joking. Dude, when have I ever been glib about anything ever? He enters the room in that in this terrible SWAT cosplay, doing a little runway strut, runway strut and twirl to show off his tactical gear. There's real armor here, you know. They could probably find something that fits you. No way! You can hear the smile in his voice. So I can look like a role-playing dork? No thank you. You look like a you buy and eat MREs from the army surplus store. You look like you're gonna die of the plague at 17 and leave behind a wife and two children. You look like you share some Facebook memes about hating your wife and children. What can I say? I never should have married that old ball and chain. Luke grins. So ready for our mission to save the world? Yes. Definitely. That's the spirit. How are you feeling? This baby? He taps his chest. He taps his. He taps his chest of body armor. Invincible, unspeakable, existential horrors have got nothing on 21st century technology. You like the love child of Gandalf and John McClane? Ha! I think I read a fan fiction about that once. Let me tell you, he doesn't die hard in that one. I wish you kept that secret. Safe. I'm sure I haven't saved on my phone. There's never been any signal down here, but Luke digs his phone out of one of the many pockets on his body and makes a show of pretending to read from it. 
I'm ready for you, John panted. He ached it with the longing of the other man's hard wooden staff. Clane bottoms in this? They take turns. It's a very versatile relationship that way. Now let me finish. I worked really hard. I mean, I'm sure whoever wrote this worked. What did you say this story was called? You're holding back a grin as you buy into, his, into this premise. It's fun to banter like this for a bit. Pretend that you're people you're not. For no other reason than making the other laugh in this fantasy world. You pull out your own phone and pretend to scroll through it. I didn't. I found it. The only John McClane Gandalf fanfiction in the world, by CoolCat69. Sounds like a cool dude. Chapter 1 of 125, A Good Day to Fuck Hard. Luke laughs, the sound unusually bright and twinkling. He almost seems surprised by the honesty of your interaction, even if none of it was true in the typical sense. Feels good to have someone who gets you again. The two of you make your way out into the castle grounds, where a humble carriage awaits you. It's a smart, trim buggy that looks like it could barely fit a few people. Magically powered! No steeds, no fuel, no motors! Very echo-friendly! That sounds great, but you're still not sure how any group other than an alley of clowns could fit in there. Remus waves you over from by the carriage's door, one foot resting on the steps. Interesting choice of armor, Luke. If anyone else has anything to say about it, they don't speak up. <laughs> Cedric has a pained expression on his face, while West looks nonplussed. After you? Remus clambers in first and extends a hand to you, pulling you into the carriage. Whoa! The vehicle is bigger than the inside, its conservatively sized door giving way to a lavish train car, the soft carpet flooring depresses under your weight. The others climb in quickly after you. Cedric is the last to enter. You notice there's a new short sword hanging around his waist you haven't seen before, and it taps the side of the doorframe as he enters. He notices you looking, and, he takes, and as he takes his seat, he explains... I was told it was good luck. I was supposed to protect you from getting sick, poison, stuff like that. He shrugs as he runs his thumb over the golden pommel of the sword. And though it might confer on him some of that luck. As though it might confer on him some of that luck. The carriage begins to move on its own, lurching forward with a start before stabilizing to a more steady speed. It's really happening. The entire morning has been such a blur that you haven't had a chance to comprehend what you're getting yourself into. Remus rolls out a weathered map on the table holding one corner flat with a pouch of coins and another with an abandoned mug. He stabs a finger at a particular point. It will be our first challenge. It will reach the Willows Grove by tonight. But it would be in our best interest to set camp outside of its borders. The Willows Grove? What's that? A haunted forest. The trees bleed black at night and the air smells of iron. Oh. Then we will continue through the abandoned silver mines of Uz... Uzgrazidon. We will have to leave our carriage in the hands of the closest village, and if all goes well, we can return for it. Uzgruzi what? Sorry, the mines of what? Uh, Uzgruzidan. It's a civilization that preceded ours. No one knows where they went, only that they left behind abandoned mines and ruins. Cool. And finally, we'll make our way across the sheer torn cliffs. The invisible bridge can only maintain one's weight while one believes in its existence. Here, closer at the map to get a better look. Each location is lovingly rendered in ink, winding rivers drawn alongside intricate forests and coastlines. Why go around the river? We can skip all this if we just cross here. Luke points his Luke puts his finger on the map, and Remus shakes his head. Tsk tsk. The rapids are too dangerous this time of year. The glacier runoff makes it impossible to cross. Remus wraps a knuckle against the spread map. A proper adventure. It has been a while. The minutes pass slowly. There's no window to look out of, though you're not sure what kind of view you'd get from the warped proportions of this car. Luke pulls out a deck of cards and wraps Wes up in a card game, while Cedric and Remus pour over the map and discuss cities and rivers that you've never ever, that you've never heard of. Luke. You join Wes and Luke, who are happy to accommodate you in their game of Go Fish. By the time you've handily won a few rounds, Luke suggests raising the stakes with poker. He even throws down a few gold coins on the table. Wes agrees, and who are you to do anything but cave to peer pressure? In a matter of a few games, you're cleaned out. Luke has a big mouth, and unfortunately, good enough luck to back it up. There are a few times Wes could have won with a better hand, but he always, but he was always too quick to fold. As for you, well, you never had the best of luck anyways. Suddenly, a sharp crack sounds from outside the carriage, and the room is so sharply tilted to the right, sending tables and chairs sliding across the interior. Everyone scrambles for the opposite end, trying to get a hold on anything bolted down. The carriage begins to violently shudder and shake, bouncing up and down the unpaved dirt road. There's a rattling sound near the back axle. Sounds like we blew a wheel! Fix it! Yeah, let me just grab the spare wooden wheel in the truck while we're still moving! 
Turn it off! Luke already has his hand out in concentration, muttering what you think is an incantation, except you hear under his breath. Do this, Luke! Fix this, Luke! Magically, uh, magic, ba magic basically makes you on-call handyman, right? The carriage seems to begin to slow, the rattling growing quieter, until gravity begins to teeter towards the front of the car, like a roller coaster about to go down a steep drop. Everyone moves slowly towards the back of the car. A stray coin slides off a table and towards the front of the carriage. The whole thing, the whole thing tips forward, plummeting downwards and sending the furniture on, on another journey across the carriage. I stopped it! You feel your stomach rise in your throat, weightless in the near freefall. Actually, freefall would be better. As it stands now, the five of you are careening down a bumpy hill, occasionally leaving the ground, only to slam back down with a sickening crunch of wood. Out the door! A particularly nasty bump dislodges you from your perch, about to throw you against the furniture piled up on the front of the car when something catches your sh something catches your collar. Watch it! Now you're choking! The hem of your shirt pressing against your throat. Somewhere you can't see, there's a low, heavy thunk and a crack. Suddenly, the sound of your barreling down the hill is much clearer. Someone must have busted down the door! Straining for breath, you tap Cedric's arm and surrender. Shit! Sorry! Cedric lets you go, and gravity throws you, a bit less violently than, he, than if he hadn't caught you, against an upturned table. From your sprawled position, you see Wes leaning half of his body out of the moving car. One hand on the frame, one hand back towards the cabin. Cliff ahead! Luke furiously ties a loop at one end of a heavy rope, muttering the whole time about Boy Scouts and bullshit. He presses this end into Wes's hand. Wes braces himself against the doorframe and readies the rope like a lasso. Kieran, your sword! Luke knocks the other end of the rope. He looks around the room for something to secure it to. The sword! You finally understand what Cedric is saying and fumble for the scabbard at your waist. Your hands are sweaty as you unsheathe it, awkwardly trying to find your footing amidst the constantly changing gravity. Alright, I'm gonna pause it right here. Then the choice just came up. Alright, y'all, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell. Leave a super thanks or a tip if you can, it always helps. Until the next video, I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye bye!